We were discussing the measurement of the cosmological parameters, but we stumbled while discussing the cosmic microwave background in homogeneities and uh, the uh, baryon acoustic oscillations into the field of the evolution of structure. We claimed that we had found in these primordial fluctuations at the time of uh, uh, the uh, uh, last scattering at the age of uh, 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the seeds of the inhomogeneities we detect in the universe today. Now, once you acknowledge that the universe is not completely homogeneous and isotropic, we are not abandoning the cosmological principle. We are still dealing with a universe that in the large is homogeneous and isotropic, but we are admitting that on small scales there are inhomogeneities, galaxies and clusters, what we actually observe. And uh, the question is uh, two, in fact. Uh, and let me uh, address this. I should point out before we start that not only is this uh, going to be a less simple field so that we will be uh, less able to be precise with our simple calculations, it is also a topic that is very much still in development. Uh, the theory of structure formation cannot, I think, be said to be a settled field like Keplerian orbits. And so there are ongoing developments and I will uh, describe what I think uh, I can. So what do we know? Well, uh, the treatment that, uh, the, the level at which we understand uh, treating uh, general relativistic cosmology in the presence of a full treatment of an inhomogeneous universe is far too complicated for us. So we tend to separate the problem into two pieces. One is uh, a universe that is by and large homogeneous and isotropic in which there is a small fluctuation like the uh, little ripples that we discussed in the context of the uh, baryon acoustic oscillations and where this fluctuation is uh, small compared to the ambient energy density. In that case, we can make an expansion, think of a almost homogeneous universe with a small fluctuation and solve the simplified equations that uh, arise from that. At some point, if the fluctuation grows, and certainly a galaxy is not a small perturbation on the vacuum, uh, it is a huge uh, uh, density compared to the average uh, density of the universe. Uh, at some point, the fluctuation becomes so large that basically we can ignore uh, when we're discussing the collapse of the solar nebula, cosmic expansion has nothing to do with it on the scales of the solar nebula. The density, uh, the, the inter gravitational interaction, the binding energy in the solar nebula is so much larger than the energies involved in the cosmic expansion that we can neglect the fact that the cosmos is expanding. So we sew together these two solutions and a uh, typical uh, uh, way to, to uh, connect them is that once a, and, and this is borne out by, in simple cases, we can actually do a relativistic treatment uh, of a suitably symmetric uh, deformation. It's a little uh, technically involved, but it can be done. And one finds that when the uh, variation in density locally uh, is of the order of the mean average density of the universe, then uh, that chunk of the universe decouples from the Hubble flow, stops expanding with the universe, and starts to contract. And from that moment on, you can follow it using sort of Newtonian evolution uh, in a local region, ignoring the Hubble flow. Now, uh, so to, uh, we will assert that once you have obtained a variation in density of order one uh, relative to the ambient density, then that will form, depending on the mass that you're looking at, a cluster of galaxies or a supercluster or a galaxy, depending on the fragmentation process, which is sort of understood and is a separate branch, not part of the uh, cosmological approach that we're looking at. Now, initially, if the universe were completely homogeneous at any given time, then of course it would remain completely homogeneous forever. So one has to have some fluctuations, and indeed we see some fluctuations uh, when we look at the cosmic microwave background at the time of uh, decoupling or at the uh, surface of last scattering, we see that it all scales up to the sound horizon. There are fluctuations and they are of the order of one part in 10,000. Uh, you will notice that I incorporated uh, the factor of three between temperature and density that I gave and the fact that the temperature variations are a few part in 100,000. The 
this reflects density fluctuations of the order of one part in 10,000. And now there are two questions, or three. One is, uh, if you have a small fluctuation, two things can happen. It can dissipate into the expanding universe, or if the gravitational force inside uh, the, the uh, denser area overcomes the expansion, then it will begin to contract. Density uh, will continue to increase, and uh, we call those fluctuations growing. If they grow, and if this, these fluctuations grow and attain uh, order one deviation from the average, then we will assert that that is where galaxies form. And our job, of course, since we observe galaxies, is to find a mechanism that admits, uh, that allows this to happen. Moreover, it has to happen in the time allotted because we know when galaxies started forming, or we at least see old galaxies, and we know that galaxies had to have formed by the time we see the oldest pulsars. And the third question, the one we will not answer, is we see these fluctuations, we saw how they are, the fluctuations at uh, decoupling are related to earlier fluctuations at the end of the radiation era uh, by the propagation of acoustic waves in the plasma. But where did those initial fluctuations come from? We will answer that. This is sort of chasing back the uh, uh, flying rubber ball back to the hand that threw it up. We will answer the defer this last question for later and try to address these first two uh, first. And so, what is the question? If you have a given fluctuation, will it dissipate into the expanding universe or will it grow? And the answer. Uh, is very related to our old discussion of the genes instability. Now, what was the genes instability? The genes instability asserted that if you have a cloud of gas, say, or nebula, at some temperature and some mass and size, then when the um, average thermal energy of uh, objects is of the order of the average gravitational potential energy, here m is the mass of the object, r its size, t its temperature, and mu, the characteristic mass of a particle in the nebula, um, say a hydrogen atom. So when these two quantities are of the same order of magnitude, then we said the cloud will collapse, and we use this to estimate things like the temperature of the solar nebula before it collapsed, and so on. And then in a homework problem, we use dimensional analysis to estimate the time uh, it takes for this object to collapse, and the time scale was what we called the Kelvin-Helmholtz time scale, and if you look back at your solutions, dimensional analysis suggested that the time scale, this is time, not temperature, sorry for the uh, notational uh, inconsistency, is of the order of the square root of r cubed over gm. Now we want to write this in terms of density, so we remember that m is up to constants, and we're working to within constants, uh, given by the volume of a object, 4 pi over 3 r cubed, of course everything is spherical, times the density. And so plugging that into here, we see that the constants are irrelevant, r cubed cancel. The time of collapse is proportional to 1 over the square root of g rho. Why am I saying all of this? Because this suggests another way to think of the genes criterion. Here's another way to think of the genes criterion. Let me clear up my mess. Um, the speed of sound in an ideal gas, which is what we are assuming uh, here our cloud to be, is on the order, again, there is a factor of order one that I'm neglecting here, the ratio of pressure to volume, uh, taken the square root of the ratio of pressure to volume. Um, if you compute the d units, you will see that the ratio of pressure to volume indeed has units of velocity squared. And this turns out to be an estimate for the speed of sound. Um, in an ideal gas, of course, we know that uh, P over rho is K Boltzmann T over mu. We have had a lot of fun playing with that relation in various homework problems and computing average masses and so on. And so I know that we are all familiar with this, so I will replace the speed of sound with root of KB T over mu. And now this gives me another way to think of the genes criterion. Notice, if I take the speed of sound in an ideal gas, multiply it by the time of collapse for a cloud uh, that we got from dimensional analysis, I find, well, plugging in, everything's a square root, so I pull a square root out, kbt divided by mu times uh, r cubed divided by gm. And the cool thing here is that if kbt is of the order of gm mu over r, 
then KBT is GM mu over R, I get a uh, root of uh, uh, R squared here, and I find that of this quantity, the speed of sound time the time, times the time of collapse, is of order the radius when the mass of the object is exactly the gene's mass. Remember, this determines the critical mass at a given temperature and so on. So here's our new way to think of the gene's instability. An object will be in, uh, unstable to gravitational collapse if the product of the speed of sound times the time of collapse is of order the size of the object, um, and this is, for ideal gases, the same genes criterion we used before. It turns out, and this would take us beyond the scope of the physics we're doing here, that this in fact generalizes to things that are not ideal gases, such as, say, charged plasmas strongly interacting with radiation. Uh, you can define uh, a genes radius, r sub j, which is given by uh, the speed of sound times uh, the uh, time to collapse, which is up to factors of 2, um, 1 over the square root of g times rho. So this expression, it turns out, well, for an ideal gas, it is up to factors of order 1, the same as our old definition of the uh, gene's mass. And uh, for something that is not an ideal gas, this is the correct way to describe whether it's unstable, basically what this is telling you is that uh, the time it takes a sound wave to propagate from one end of the object to the other, or from the center out to the edge, uh, is of the order of the time that uh, gravitational collapse would take. So the object is able to collapse gravitationally in a coherent way. So having motivated, uh, certainly not derived, this expe expression for the gene's radius, the smallest size at a given density that a collection of matter with a particular speed of sound will collapse, I can of course just use that to, to uh, compute the gene's mass in terms of the density and this object, uh, the gene's radius. This, it turns out, is the way to extend the calculation to something that is not um, uh, an ideal gas. Uh, you need to use the speed of sound as the bridging gap. Why is this important? Because prior to uh, the decoupling transition, uh, the baryonic matter in the universe was far from being an ideal gas. Uh, in fact, it was this tightly dense plasma, tightly inter strongly interacting with radiation, in which the speed of sound was only 1 over square root 3 times the speed of light. Uh, this means, if you compute it, that the gene's radius for um, uh, baryonic fluctuations was larger than the horizon radius. And so baryonic fluctuations did not grow. Indeed, we discussed that what happens to fluctuations in the density of baryons uh, during the time before the decoupling era, when we had a dense plasma, was they oscillated. We found a wave behavior. The fluctuation did not sort of exhibit an in gravitational instability and grow, but it propagated. Now, if you have a situation where you have a fluctuation larger than the appropriate uh, genes radius, but smaller than the horizon size, so that it can still talk to itself, um, in the context of an expanding universe, if the universe is dust-dominated, you find that, yes, those fluctuations do grow gravitationally in the sense that uh, the deviation from average density grows like the two-thirds power of t, uh, coinciding with the growth of the scale factor. Uh, and so, now we have our information. Uh, imagine that we have these primordial fluctuations with delta rho over rho at the time of decoupling of order 10 to the minus 4. Uh, imagine that these, uh, now that the uh, photons have decoupled, now the speed of sound reduces to its thermal value. Uh, the, uh, the, some of these fluctuations are larger than the gene's mass, and so they can, in fact, start to collapse, and they will decouple from the Hubble flow when delta rho over rho becomes of order 1, and then they will rapidly undergo gravitational collapse. The time for collapse, as we saw, is rather short on cosmological scales. So, uh, how long will this take? Well, we need to get to delta rho over rho of order 1, starting a ionization with delta rho over rho of order 10 to the minus 4. So we, this will happen at a time 
relative to T ionization, where T over T ionization to the two thirds is about 10,000. This is a problem because this is T ionization is uh, 380,000 uh, years. This leads to a few uh, hundred billion years. Uh, these fluctuations, the ones we observe in the cosmic microwave background, are not uh, sufficient to produce, they will grow, they will eventually collapse, but they won't produce galaxies in time. And in fact, in our universe, because of the exponential expansion taking over, all of these dust-dominated uh, approximations will cease to hold. And if these were the primordial, the fluctuations that we had at decoupling, we would not have galaxies. So clearly something is wrong. Uh, in particular, the earliest known quasars extend all the way out, we said, to Z of order 8. And so what we need is, remember that... Uh, uh, z, uh, 1 over z plus 1, in other words, a ninth is a of t. So uh, we have uh, uh, a of t uh, of order 1 ninth, a at ionization is uh, 100, 1 over 1100. I sort of uh, cheated a little bit. The ratio of a's is the ratio of times to the two thirds because we're in a dust dominated universe. This would have required at ionization. Uh, a ratio, uh, a fractional uh, fluctuation, well, I should have put 9 over 1100, but pretend that we found the oldest quasar at z equals 7, of order 7 or, or 8 parts in 1,000, not one part in 10,000. We are off by almost two orders of magnitude. This is the problem of structure. And uh, the solution to this turns out to be quite interesting. Um, it turns out that in modern cosmological scenarios, we have an understanding of why this is not inconsistent. What is the solution? Well, remember, whatever fluctuations we started with, we will explain why, uh, at the end of the radiation era, the beginning of the matter-dominated era, those included fluctuations both in baryonic matter and in dark matter. Uh, whatever created those primordial fluctuations, the hand that threw up the rubber ball, will we have, we will see, did we will see create fluctuations of similar type in both kinds of dust. However, during the time from the beginning of the matter-dominated era until recombination, uh, baryons behaved very differently from dark matter. Baryons are coupled to radiation. The fluctuations travel and propagate as plasma waves. They do not grow. On the other hand, the velocity of sound in dark matter was low even before decoupling because it was not a tightly bound plasma. The genes radius for dark matter was well inside the sound horizon, and fluctuations uh, in dark matter were able to grow uh, as a factor of t to the two-thirds from the end of the radiation era until the decoupling time. And so at decoupling, we have small fluctuations in baryons because they did not grow, but parametrically larger fluctuations in dark matter these generate then deep potential, gravitational potential wells into which the baryons, once liberated from the uh, photons and able to collapse, uh, as baryonic matter begins to collapse, these collapsing chunks of baryonic matter fall into the gravitational wells uh, produced by the dark matter fluctuations. And it is in this sense that dark matter, uh, the fluctuations in dark matter, seed the structures that we see today uh, in the universe. And, uh, again, the detailed calculations are outside the scope of what we are doing here, um, but it is interesting to watch. This is a recent simulation uh, in which this is a region of, I believe, um, a few uh, million light year, a few tens of millions of light years on a side. This is a cube of space a few million, tens of millions of light years on a side co-moving. So it's a few tens of millions of light years today, and it's expanding with the universe. And in it, what is done is one seeds random fluctuations of the observed magnitude in both dark matter and visible matter, and then lets uh, 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 gravitation take over. And the simulation um, indicates and shows us that over time, what we see is a Z counts down over here at the top, we see the formation of these uh, filament-like structures quite reminiscent of uh, the structures that we, the voids and large-scale structures that we saw in the universe.
So structure formation is a problem. It is not a solved problem. The mathematics is too complicated for us to pursue it in detail. The model of the universe in which we have a long dust dominated era and in which most of the uh, dense energy density is in the form of dark matter that does not couple to radiation can produce in uh, uh, as solutions to the equations uh, results that are not that dissimilar from what we observe in the universe. This is very encouraging. We think we have the beginnings of an understanding in this concordance model uh, where all the parameters come together to produce a reasonable answer where what we observe in the microwave background agrees with what we observe in today's universe, prompting us now to say, well, where did those primordial fluctuations come from? And in general, what happened before the uh, dust era? And we'll turn to what is called the early universe, the more speculative uh, physics in this week's uh, material in the next clip.